right, so the great reversal. We are going to continue on. And now we are up to Luke chapter 15. And so we're going to read a little bit in Luke and see what's happening now. Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law mutter, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, throughout this series, we've seen where Jesus has done the exact opposite of what was expected of him. He did, and he said, the total reversal of what people thought he would say and do. He did the total reversal of what people wanted him to say and do. Last week, we saw where Jesus was among a crowd, and they were following him, and he turns to them and basically, in a sense, throws waters on their hopes and dreams and just blows to bits their ideals of what it would mean to have this Messiah come. They thought the Messiah would come in this powerful, mighty way to bring them the salvation, and he basically just blew that all to bits and uh, let them know that the only way to truly follow Christ would be to take up their cross and follow him and be prepared to live a crucified life. And this was a sobering thought. This is not what they expected. This is not what they needed or necessarily wanted to hear, they thought. But they got an eye-opening account of what it would mean to put Christ first above all else. And so that happened, and now we have Jesus in the midst of another group of people, including tax collectors and sinners. And they were all gathered around to hear Jesus, along with some Pharisees and some teachers of the law. And this is what he had to say next. Continuing on. Then Jesus told them this parable. Some of, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And so to set the stage here, we see that we've got Jesus with a crowd of people as usual around him. There are some Pharisees, there are some teachers of the law, and then there are two other groups that are identified in this chapter, tax collectors and sinners. Now, the tax collectors were notoriously dishonest. They, they had aligned themselves with Rome. They were the um, Rome, the oppressors of Israel. So they were kind of seen as the enemy. And they all together just could not be trusted. And then you've got the sinners, those pesky little sinners. That's a wide, wide group of people. And these are people who were excluded for a variety of reasons. And we've been learning about them all along. They were basically outcasts of society. They were unfit to fellowship with the righteous of the community. And most of them were poor. And some of them, in fact, were probably so poor that they didn't even get the benefit of getting to know the law or hear the law and be taught the proper ways. So here they are out doing their thing, doing their sinner thing, and they don't even know that they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing because they don't have the benefit of being taught properly. They were just the social outcasts. They were the drunks of society. They were sinners. And here is Jesus mingling with them, talking with them. Two unacceptable social groups were gathered around to hear what Jesus had to say, and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law didn't like it one bit. They did not approve. So they started muttering to one another, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. How dare he welcome sinners and eat with them? So Jesus knew what was going on, and in response to this grumbling, he told a story. He told a parable about a shepherd who has lost one of his hundred sheep. But not only did he tell a story, but he placed them in the story, and he says to them, suppose one of you had a hundred sheep and you lost one. Just suppose. Now, it's kind of subtle, but this was a very offensive statement because the Pharisees and the teachers of the law could not relate to being called a shepherd. The role of a shepherd was beneath them. That's, nothing, that's never something they would ever um, attain to be or do. That's nothing that they would ever even begin to relate to. But Jesus was trying to make a point here. 
This isn't a case of Jesus missing his audience and, and not quite hitting the mark. No, actually, he hit a bullseye, and he was speaking to people who were supposed to be religious leaders of the, in the community, and he was saying to them, suppose one of you has lost one of your hundred sheep. These men of status, these pillars of the community, these insiders of the religious society were supposed to be shepherding God's people and caring for them. That was supposed to be their role. They were supposed to be God in flesh, caring for his people. But instead, they chose not to be an expression of God's love. But instead, they had their laws, and they had their rules, and they had their grumbling, and they had their complaining, and they had their judgments. And this um, issue that Jesus is addressing here is something that had been going on for several, many, 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 many years. And I think he was just a little bit tired of it. In fact, in the Old Testament, the prophet, the prophet Ezekiel says in, verse 30, in chapter 34, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool, and slaughter the choice animals. But you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You have not brought, ba brought back the strays, or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. Through this simple parable, the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus is addressing two main issues. First, the issue of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law grumbling about his associations. Any time, and we've seen it over and over and over again, any time Jesus would reach out or associate or entertain or eat with someone who was socially unacceptable, they had a complaint to say about it. They had grumbling and mumbling. But they were supposed to be shepherds caring for the flock. Their job as shepherds was to strengthen the weak, heal the sick, bind up the injured, bring back the strays and search for the lost. But instead, they treated people harshly and deemed people unfit and unacceptable. They labeled people unfit, unacceptable, outcasts not worthy of our company. And so this is what Jesus had to come and do. He had to come to strengthen the weak. He had to come to heal the sick. He had to come to bind up the injured. And he had to come to bring back the strays and search for the lost. Jesus is our great shepherd. This is the type of savior that he would be. It's totally unexpected than what they thought that they wanted or needed. But this is what he had to offer, healing, strength, salvation, restoration. He is the great shepherd. Secondly, he was addressing those who are lost, the outcasts, the downtrodden, the sinners, for lack of a better word, like the lost sheep. Now, this may be difficult, but I want you to take yourself right now and place yourself in the place of this sheep, this lost sheep. Place yourself as this sheep who somehow becomes lost. Maybe it was by your own choice. Maybe it was by your own decisions. Or maybe it was by circumstances beyond your control. Maybe it was because of the lot in life that you were dealt. But for whatever reason, you are now lost. And you're alone. And you're scared. And there's no one around to help. And you don't know what's going to happen next. And many shepherds and sheep herders say that when a sheep gets separated from the flock like this and they get scared, they will just lie down helpless and hopeless and not budge because they're just terrified and they don't know what to do. And so I want you to put yourself in that place of being alone, of being afraid. Maybe you're hungry. Maybe you're cold. You definitely don't know what's going to happen next. You're just there, a prey, ready to fall prey to anything that comes your way. Predators could attack. Who knows what could happen? It's a scary place to be. And so maybe like the sheep, you lie down and refuse to budge because you're just helpless and you're hopeless and the fear overtakes you. But the beautiful thing is, is that the shepherd does come. He comes and he has searched exhaustively and he is determined to find you. And when he does find you, he picks you up and he puts you on top of his shoulders 
and he carries you back to safety. Not only does he carry you back to safety, but he returns you to the flock. There's restoration that happens. And he proclaims to the entire community, rejoice with me because restoration has occurred and now the celebration can begin because I have found my lost sheep. This one who was lost, this one who was alone, this one who was separated, this one who was outcast has been restored. The shepherd went and searched, determined to find that one lost one. And when he did, he picked him up and carried him back on the long journey home. And the journey may have been hard, and the path may have been rough, but he was a determined shepherd, and he was determined to return his sheep to his flock. And so what Jesus was saying here, and it's a very simple parable, but it's very pretty, it's very cool. He's saying that instead of the grumbling and the judging of the Pharisees and the religious leaders, instead of getting all bent out of shape every time that um, he's reaching out to these outcasts, to these downtrodden, to these sinners. Instead of all of that, there should be rejoicing and there should be celebration because there is one who is lost who's being, who has been found and brought back into the fold. Throughout this parable, Jesus is revealing the true heart of God. He is revealing God's true heart for the lost, God's true heart for the lonely, for the scared, for the messed up, for the outcast. It's always a good idea to ask when you read something like this, what is it, what stands out? What are you saying, Lord? Speak to me. What is it? And if you read in the prayer journal, you'll see that you'll read a few verses and it says, what stands out to you? And so I've been asking myself that. What stands out? Lord, what are you, what are you saying to me? And I couldn't help but uh, identify with the lost sheep. I couldn't help but identify with that one who was disenfranchised, who was separated from safety, who was alone, lost, cold, afraid, and just left to whatever may happen, just open to attack. My mom and my dad live in Texas. I'm originally from Texas, and I'm very proud of that. They live there, and um, when we moved up here, it was very sad. They really, um, they miss. They miss us. They miss their daughter. They miss their son-in-law. They miss their grandchildren. We're very close, despite the distance. We talk a lot. We email a lot, text a lot. My dad even joined MySpace and Facebook just to keep up with me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> go dad. <laughs> so we're, we're very close. I'm sure we're a little quirky, and I'm sure there's some dysfunctionality there. Who doesn't have that? But we're a very close family, and I miss them very much. We, myself, Sc myself and my husband, Scott, have um, three little boys. And our youngest son is named after my dad. And right now, and I know it's going to be hard for you to believe it because I'm so very thin, but right now I'm pregnant <laughs> with, <laughs> with my fourth child. And this is a girl, a little girl. Shock. Anyway, and our daughter is going to be named after my father's mother who's uh, passed away. But we're a very close family, and I miss them very much. And they've come up to visit some, and it's very cold for them up here, and they enjoy the warm weather down there. But if, uh, if on one of their visits you, would, you were to meet them, you would notice a couple of things. One, they're both very tall. My dad is 6'3", almost 6'4". My mom is practically six feet tall. They're both fair-skinned. My dad has blue eyes. My mom has green eyes. Very cool people. I love them a lot. Um, but before long, you might begin to wonder, and you probably wouldn't ask, because you're very polite that way, you're very Minnesota nice, but you might begin to wonder what the deal is. They're tall, me not so much. Our coloring is totally different. We love each other very much. We're a very happy family, but my life hasn't always been that way. 34 years ago when I was born, 34 years ago, I was born uh, to a, a Caucasian mother and an African-American father. And for whatever reason that I've never known, and um, it doesn't really even matter, but my father, my birth father, was never a part of my life. And so I was raised by a single mother, and this is common, unfortunately, in our society today. But I was raised by a single mother with a lot of stress that it takes being a single mother and trying to raise a child. And my life was a little different, and it was a little strange, and it just was a little dysfunctional in and of itself. So my life was pretty much spent um, with a mother who worked during the day and went out at night. Um, she would always have a boyfriend here or there, and there was always 
uh, a revolving door of men in and out of the house. And I was always kind of left to fend for myself and just kind of take care of myself from a very young age. From a very young age, I learned what it meant to be rejected because of who I was. I learned um, that not everyone would accept me because I was biracial. Um, even people within my own family didn't accept me because I was biracial. Um, one of my, the only time I ever met my, my mother's mother, my grandmother, was when I was with my mother and my aunt and some of my cousins, and we went to her restaurant. This is all down in Texas, and um, went to a restaurant, and I couldn't go in. I couldn't go in because I wasn't accepted. I couldn't go in because I wasn't good enough because I was a biracial kid. I couldn't go in because my grandmother didn't acknowledge me, didn't acknowledge my existence. So I learned very early that um, rejection is a reality of life. And I learned very early that um, some people will be ashamed of who I am. Like I said before, my mother had a sort of revolving door of men in and out of our home. And um, depending on what suited the need, I, I would have to go along with whatever nationality she said I was. Because some people just did not approve of the fact that she had been with an African American man. And so I there was a lot of confusion there, a lot of questioning there. Why would I have to lie about who I am if this is who I am? But that's just the way it was. I learned at a very young age the, the strange um, truth of the fact that many of these men who my mother brought home were not only interested in her, but were also interested in me. So I learned at a very early age to uh, lock my bedroom door at night. Um, we were very nomadic. We moved around a lot. We um, never stayed in the same place more than once. We were poor, didn't have much, learned very early how to work the system, how to get uh, uh, stuff from other people. I learned how to take a really big bag into the grocery store so we could steal food and bring it home, so I could steal food and bring it home. Because if I got caught, then surely they'd let me go. So I think that was the kind of the logic behind that. I never uh, went to the same school for very long, never finished out the school year at the same school, never started the school year at the same school, never had a consistent community life or home life of friends and family and all that around. It was just survival. And I learned that survival very early. And this was my normal life. This is all that I knew for like the first nine years of my life. And then at the age of nine, my mom, my mother met someone and um, started seeing him, and, and he was sticking around a lot more, and I really began to think that quite possibly this time things could be a little different. They were gonna get married, and that was very different for me, so I thought quite possibly now with two parents in the home, I would have a, a mother and a father. With two parents in the home, surely things would calm down. Surely things would get back to normal. You know, um, maybe she wouldn't have to work so much. Surely she wouldn't be going out all the time at night and leaving me home alone. Maybe I wouldn't have to be a latchkey kid and, and come home from school and take care of myself and do my chores and take care of everything. Maybe all that would change because we would have a stable family environment. There would be a mother and a father, and it would be great, and this would be the answer to all of our problems. Maybe she wouldn't be so stressed out and take it out on me if she had this stability in her life. And so I was excited about this. I was excited about this marriage. And so uh, my mother got married to my stepfather and it wasn't too long before I realized that this wasn't gonna help or change anything, but only it was gonna make matters worse. This man that she married was very abusive, physically toward her and toward me. Uh, you never, he was very unpredictable in what would set him off. And um, it was just a unstable situation all around. And then they had my, they had my little sister, and um, th that was great. I mean, I had never had a, a sibling before, but many times I'd have to stay home from school to take care of her. For whatever reason, I don't know, I was just told that you're staying home today, so I missed a lot of school. I would have to try to cover things up when I would go back to school as to why I was gone. And all the while, thinking that things had to get better, they seemed to only get worse. The things that were happening in our home were so unpredictable, and they were st we were still poor, we were still nomadic, we were still moving from apartment to apartment, getting evicted here, getting our stuff taken there. I was still having to steal food from the store, and I was still having to lock my bedroom door at night so I would not be bothered. 
finally, around uh, the age of 10 or so, um, my mother just decided she had enough. And she took me and she took my sister and she packed us up and we got in the car and we just drove. We ran away. We ran away from my stepfather. We're going to start a new life. And um, we, may, we ran to another part of Texas. And um, where we lived in this apartment complex, there was a little Baptist church down the road. Now, I had never gone to church, had never heard about the Lord, had never known about God and his grace and his mercy and his love, had never even um, had an idea or a thought that he had uh, a love for me and a different plan for me than the life that I was living. Never knew any of that. But there was this little Baptist church, and they had a food shelf, a food pantry like we do here at Woodland. And I called because I knew that we needed food because we were on, we were on the run. We had nothing. So I called, and this nice couple brought out some food to, to my mother and my sister and I. And um, they saw how old I was, and they invited me to come to church on Wednesday nights because they have a program for girls my age. And they just said, you know what, it'd be great. You could meet some friends and get to know some people, and it'd be a really cool thing. Learn some cool stuff, and that sounded really appealing to me, so I started going. And I got to say, I'm so thankful for that place. Because that was the first time that I really began to experience, first of all, that there even was a God, but secondly, the truth of who God was and his love for, for me, a lost, alone, broken, scared sheep. This is why I relate to this parable so much. And so I went faithfully all the time on Wednesdays, and um, the teacher of the, the girls group that I was in really took an interest in me. She was a very nice, young, very nice young lady. She lived um, in the same apartment complex as us, and she would um, ask me about school, ask me about friends. She would, you know, drive me back and forth to church, and she just really became a big influence in my life. And I had never had that. I had never had someone show a genuine interest in me without wanting anything from me in return. And so that was just a really sweet experience for me and something that I really began to treasure. And so as time goes on, I began to really feel my heart being nudged and tugged by God. And I didn't have all the answers. I didn't know what it all meant, but I definitely knew that whatever it was, it was better than the cred at home, and I definitely felt the need for it. I definitely felt that um, it was better. And so I remember one Sunday going up front and signing the card and filling all, filling all that out and saying that, yes, I would be baptized. And like I said, not fully understanding, but just definitely knowing that my heart was tender toward God the Father, toward a God of love and compassion and a God of concern, um, a God of non-judgment and a God that doesn't hurt. I was very tender toward that even as a young child. And so one day when I'm getting baptized, and we had our own baptismal in the church, so we're in a side room, and I'm getting ready and getting the proper clothing on for it, and my, my teacher from Wednesday nights is in there with me to help me get ready. And um, she and I had kind of formed a relationship, and it was really sweet, and um, she, she was just really there for me. And she tells me later that it was in that moment as she's helping me get ready, she sensed God speak to her very specifically this is your daughter. This will be your daughter. And she didn't know what that meant because she was single. She had no desire necessarily for children of her own. That just really wasn't her. She liked kids, but she thought she, the thought of being a mother to her had never really entered her mind. It just wasn't a part of her game plan. So she just kind of piled that away and, and, and just would always pray on that. And time went on, and, um, and as she continued to be a part of my life, she would just always say, if you need me, Shauna, if you need me, you know you can call me. I will always be available to you. And again, that was very different for me. So my life goes on. Eventually, my mother decided to take back my stepfather. He found us. She took him back. Um, she forgave him. I think her need to have someone there with her was, was greater than her fear of being abused and was greater than her fear of the violence. So she took him back, and things hadn't changed. And things had only gotten worse. And he was more violent. He was more abusive. He was more cruel. And, um, and he did not like me whatsoever, apart from the fact that he wanted stuff from me. And so once again, I found myself having to defend myself physically, having to lock my bedroom door at night so as to be left alone, and really just kind of left wondering when this all would end. The difference this time was I had a different kind of knowledge. I had a different kind of truth. I knew 
I knew that there was a God, and I knew that he was not pleased with what was going on. I knew that there was a God, and I knew that he would not allow these things to continue to happen. I knew there was a God, and I knew that I was worthy of proper love and proper care. And so with that truth, I would just hold on and wait and hold on and wait because I knew that some, something had to happen and something had to change. And one night, when it got really bad at home, I decided enough was enough, and I left. I ran away. I'm not saying that was the best solution, but for me, it was the only solution. I was just sick and tired of it. And so I slipped through my bedroom window one night, and I didn't look back. And through various circumstances and various situations, my teacher from Wednesday night found out that I was out there and that I was alone and that I was scared like the lost sheep, that I was hurting and that I was in need. Her situation had changed, though, and she had gotten married. And she would gotten married, and they were going to be going into the ministry. And she remembered what the Lord had told her about me, but she also knew that right now her life was so different. The Lord has spoken that to her, but now she's married, and she shares her life with another person. So what does that mean? So um, I went to a children's home for a while. I went to a children's home for about eight months, and during that time, um, this couple would come and visit me. And I would get to know him, her new husband, and, and further my relationship with her. And during some holidays and times when we didn't have school, they would invite me back to their home for the weekend, and I would visit with them. Now, I knew I loved this woman. I knew I cared for this woman because she had been someone that I could count on and trust. But this man who she was married to, I was very uncertain of. My history with men had not been great. I had never known a man who didn't want something inappropriate from me. And so during this eight months of visiting with them and them coming to take me to visit them in their home and stuff, um, we began to build a relationship. And slowly, um, trust came. And slowly, healing came. And slowly, I began to see that not everyone was out to harm and to hurt. Not everyone was out to do wrong to a little child. And so um, th there's a lot more to the story, but basically, um, at the age of 13, this man and this woman came to that home, and they picked me up, and they took me to their home, and they adopted me, and I've been a part of their home ever since. <laughs> when I talk about my mom and dad, when my kids refer to Grammy and Grampy, it's James and Suzanne. It's that couple. It's that woman from Wednesday night who is my teacher and her husband who answered the call of God and decided to be God in flesh, Jesus with hands and feet, and go after one lost, lonely, broken little girl and return her to the fold and bring her to safety. That is the beauty of what God does, not only for me, but for each of us. If we are lost, if we are lonely, if we are hurting, if we are afraid, he does not relent. He does not give up. He is determined to find a way to come to you, to find you, and to pick you up and to carry you home. And when he carries you home, there is safety. There is restoration. There is healing. And I got to say, I am a healed woman. I am a whole woman. I love the song they sang, Imagine Me, because it's gone. All that stuff is gone, and I am not bitter, because God has brought the salvation, and God has brought the healing, and God has brought this restoration, and it is gone. And were it not for two people who said, yes, we will do what we feel God calling us to do, I would not be standing here today. I would not be the wife that I am, the mother that I am, the whole woman that I am standing before you here today. And it is all to the glory of God. Thank you. So when I look at this parable, it's simple, but it means so much because I so identify with that lost sheep. And I so know what it means to be sought after. I so know what it means to be looked for. I know what it means to be lost and afraid and alone and then be, to be brought back and restored and to be safe and whole. He is the great shepherd. And he will go after and search for one lost, lonely, al alone, and afraid. 
If you're out there and you are lost, if you're out there and you are alone, if you are out there and you are afraid, maybe it's because of choices you have made, maybe it's because of things that have happened to you, it doesn't matter. There is one who will not relent. There is one who will go after you with all of his might. There is one whose sole purpose is to grab you, pick you up, put you safely on his shoulders, and bring you back to safety. And that one is our great shepherd. And we are his sheep, and we are his flock. I want us to close by reading Psalm 23. So if everyone would, please, if you can and you're able, stand up. We are all his sheep. We are all in the care of the great shepherd. We are all in the safety of his flock. And whether you feel it or not, you just need to know that it's true. And so I want us to read this together as a closing prayer. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. 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 Thank you all for being here today. If you are in need of the great shepherd, if you are lost, alone, afraid, if you just need his guidance and his help, if you need his salvation, his restoration, please come up here. The prayer team will be available to you. And in the meantime, just go and be blessed, knowing that you are so precious and so loved of God, that you do have unsurpassable worth. Thank you for being here.